because as I was preparing this lesson, I realized how much there is to this, and I don't want to leave anything out. So we're going to look at three foundations uh, today. We're going to look at the first two, and next week we will look at the third. But uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in and pray, and then we'll get right into the lesson. So let's pray, and then we will start. God, we come before you this morning, and we are just thankful, Lord, that uh, you have allowed us to gather again uh, in a house that you have prepared for us, Lord, that uh, we can come together in fellowship and uh, just be together and worship you. And God, I just pray that uh, by your Spirit this morning that you would give each of us ears to hear. Lord, just remove our traditions and um, just help us to put everything to the side and see only what your Word has said, Lord, uh, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. God, we thank you for uh, your Son, Jesus Christ, and everything that he has done for us. And Lord, we just pray that, uh, that you would be with me this morning as I bring your Word, uh, that you would keep me from error, Lord, and that you would just help us to see what your Word says about you. We love you, we thank you for Christ, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are going to be looking at the Trinity this morning. And like I said, you guys are going to be stuck with me this week and next week. But when we talk about the word Trinity, I hope that that is one that is not foreign to any of you in this room, but rather I hope that it's one that you're familiar with. Okay, in short and simple terms, what do we mean by Trinity? When we talk about the word Trinity... We are talking about the belief that God is one being and yet three persons. And I'm going to give a more detailed definition of that uh, momentarily. But I decided to use this time to teach on the Trinity because this is a topic that is absolutely essential to our faith. Okay, And yet, unfortunately, if we were to take a poll and give out tests to the majority of Christians in the world, uh, I fear how many people would actually be able to give a definition of the Trinity, let alone explain it, right? It's something that we ought to be very familiar with, but if we're honest, most of us aren't. And as Christians, it's something that we should be. In fact, we should be awfully familiar with it. And I want to give you two reasons for why that is. The first reason is in relation to our worship. Jesus said in John chapter 4 that God is spirit, and that as such, he is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So when we talk about the Trinity, we are talking about who God is, and we are also talking about what God is. And we cannot worship God in truth if we do not know or understand the truth about who He is. So it is important that we understand who God is and what He is. And so when we talk about our worship, it's vitally important that in regards to our worship, we let the Scriptures define how and what we worship. We must let them define for us how we worship, that is, how our worship is to be done and how it is to be acted out, but it's just as important when we talk about our worship that we also let it define what we worship. The Scriptures must define both of these things, both in the how and in the what. It does not matter how sincere I am in my worship if who and what I'm worshiping is not the God of the Scriptures, okay? Okay. If, if the God that I'm worshiping is not the God of the Bible, he cannot save me. If the, Jesus that, if the Jesus that I am trusting in is not the Jesus of the Scriptures, then he cannot save me. Only the true God can save. Only the true Christ can save. And so we must make sure that every single aspect of our worship is rooted in and defined by God's Word alone. A person can be sincere and yet still be sincerely wrong. Right? There's tons of faiths that we look at around the world, our Muslim friends, our Mormon friends, our Jehovah's Witness friends who are very sincere in their worship, and yet the object of their worship is not the God of the Scriptures, and so therefore, they are not Christian. We must make sure that we know what we believe and why we believe it. Secondly, we ought to be familiar with what the Trinity is because that the very gospel that we cling to and believe in and are saved by is Trinitarian in nature. It is the Father who in eternity past chose us adopted us, and decreed our salvation, who then gave us to the Son, Jesus Christ. It is the Son who then comes as the perfect Savior and dies in our place. And it is the application of the Holy Spirit who comes and regenerates us, making us alive in Christ and causing us to walk in God's ways. And so the very gospel that we believe in and are saved by is absolutely Trinitarian in its nature. And so as such... This really should be something that we are not only familiar with, but passionate about. Uh, but I think, if we're honest, maybe the reason that we're not is, again, because most of us don't really understand it. 
If someone were to come up to you and ask you about the Trinity with a camera in front of your face, how many of you could honestly say that you would be comfortable in answering those questions and being put on the Internet? And if you can't, then we need to make sure that we can, right? Because this is important. This is who our God is and what He is. Uh, so if that's you, if you're a person who's not very familiar, doesn't necessarily understand it very much, I uh, definitely can't exhaust this morning all of the wonderful truths of the Trinity. I definitely cannot exhaust all of the many, many, many places in Scripture where this truth is taught, but I hope that I can at least help you build a foundation and understand the basics of this beautiful truth that is our God. And so I want to start by asking, first off, why should we believe in the Trinity? Okay, Should we believe in the Trinity because the church that we belong to believes it? Should we believe in the Trinity because the church we grew up in that mom and dad took us to, they believed in the Trinity? Or should we believe in it because that the church historically has believed in the Trinity? I would submit to you that none of those are good reasons to believe in the Trinity. The only reason that we should believe not only in the doctrine of the Trinity, but any doctrine that we talk about theologically is because that the Bible teaches it. Okay, If someone could convince me tomorrow that the Trinity is not taught in the Scriptures, I would throw it away. But the more and more I look at the Scriptures, the more and more I study the Bible, the more I'm convinced that our God is absolutely triune in His nature. Now, someone might say, okay, but we don't even find the word Trinity in the Bible. And that's true. If you look all throughout the Scriptures, you will not find the word Trinity. So some people will assert, well, therefore it can't be true. But that's not only wrong, it's silly. Okay, because there are lots of things that we believe concepts are taught in the scriptures, but the words that we use to explain them are not found there. Let me give you some examples. For starters, did you know that the word Bible is not in your Bible? You cannot find, you cannot find the word Bible anywhere in your Bible. However, this is a word that we use, and pretty much anyone in the world that you talk to about the Bible could know what you're talking about, right? But that's not in there. What about when we talk about God's omni-properties, right? Uh, his omnipotence, that He is all-powerful, Uh, His omniscience, that He's all-knowing. His omnipresence, that He is uh, all-present everywhere, right? We don't find these omni-words in the Scriptures, but what we do find is the concepts that they teach, okay? Um, Another word, the incarnation. When we talk about God becoming flesh, the word incarnation is not found in the Scriptures. Uh, When we talk about God's divinity, the word divinity is not found in the Scriptures. Monotheism, the teaching that there is only one God, that word is not found in the Scriptures. And here's one that may cause some dispute, but the word rapture is not in your Bibles. Now, whether that's biblical or not, we can leave that on the table for you all to figure out, but the word rapture is not in there either. So the point is, is that no, the word Trinity is not in our Bibles. However, what we mean when we say Trinity absolutely is found in the Bible. So let's talk about that. What do we mean when we say Trinity? I want to give you a working definition, and this is in your handout. The Trinity is the teaching that within the one being or essence that is God, there exist eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say that one more time. Within the one being that is God, there exist eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to expand on this some because it's important that when we talk about the Trinity, we understand what we are saying, and we also understand what we are not saying. Please take note that we are not saying one being and three beings. We are not saying one being and three beings. We're not saying one God and three gods. We are not saying one person and three persons. We are saying one being, three persons. If I were to say one God and also three gods, that is a contradiction. If I were to say one person and three persons, that is a contradiction. Our God is not contradictory. Our God is is the very foundation of logic itself, and so therefore when we define Him, we must make sure that we do it logically and rightly. We are saying one being, three persons. You know, the the anti-Trinitarians will often joke, they'll say that Trinitarians don't know how to do math. They'll say, well, don't you believe that the Father's God? Yes. Okay, well, there's one God. Don't you believe the Son's God? Yes. Well, there's two gods. Don't you believe that the Holy Spirit's God? Yes. Well, there's three gods. So you believe in three gods. No, we do not. We believe in three persons who are united as one being that is God. Okay? So we are not saying one being, three beings. We're saying one being who exists as three persons. We could also understand it like this. One being, one what? Three persons, 
three who's. Okay, so what is God? He is one being. Who is God? He is three persons. Now, why do we believe this? Why do we believe that there's one being who is God that exists as three distinct, co-equal, and co-eternal persons? Well, <clears throat> the simplest answer I can give you is because from Genesis to Revelation, let me do this y'all's way, Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, you find the truth that there is one God, monotheism. But you also have scriptures all over the place where the Father is identified as God, the Son is identified as God, and the Holy Spirit is identified as God. There is nowhere in your Bible where they are identified as a God. They are identified as God, consistent with the truth that there is one God, monotheism. So monotheism, mono, meaning one, theism, meaning belief in God. So you put the two together, one, belief in God, monotheism, one God, belief in one God. The Bible's clear on this issue. We're told over and over and over again that God is God alone. He is the only God. There is no other, one God. And yet, we have multiple clear texts where they're all identified as God. Um, so that is the reality of the scriptures, that you have three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, who are all identified by the scriptures as Yahweh. And so the fact of the matter is, if we are going to believe all of the Bible, we do not take verses in isolation and remove them from the remainder of scripture. We are not only sola scriptura, that we believe in scripture alone, but we are also tota scriptura. We believe in all of scripture, right? So when we are looking at all of scripture, if we are going to be... Um, convicted to both of those truths, then you will be forced to believe in the Trinity. Okay, now let's define our terms. If we're saying one being and three persons, what do we mean by being and what do we mean by persons? And what's the difference between them? Well, when you think of the word being, think of existence. Okay, like you think about the word to be, right? Or you say to be, it means to exist. Okay, so when we talk about something having being or someone having being, we're talking about their existence. Uh, and some people, instead of the word being, they use the word essence. So if that helps you in your understanding of the Trinity, I have no problem with that. One essence of God exists as three persons. So when we say God is one, we mean that he is one being, one existence, one essence. What about persons? When we say God is three persons, what do we mean by persons? Well, when we use the word person, we are using it to show that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each have personhood or personality. That is, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit each have intellect, emotion, and a volition, or you may say a will. So we see in the scriptures that the Father, he thinks, he speaks, he has a mind. He also has emotions and feelings. He has a will. He makes choices. He makes decisions. He makes determinations. These are all characteristics that are attributed to personhood, to a person. Okay, and you see the same revealed about the Son and the same revealed about the Spirit. And there's a story that I want to give that I think will kind of help us to understand the distinction. I remember I grew up with three brothers, okay, and two of those brothers are my age, around my age. So when we were about, I don't know, 13 to 15, you can imagine all the mischief that we probably got into. Well, we hung out at my dad's house a lot, and uh, in the summer one year, we went around to the back, and my dad's house has a deck, and it hangs over the basement where there's windows, Okay, well, we went around back one day, and we saw that there was a wasp nest that had been built up in the deck and behind the panel, behind the plastic panel. And so we thought it would be fun to step back some ways and take a soccer ball and throw it at the paneling there on the deck and try to either kill the wasp or make them mad and, you know, just do teenage boy stuff. Well, uh, you can imagine what probably ended up happening. Eventually, one of us missed. The ball went below the awning there and hit one of the windows. And as a result, the window broke. Now, if at any point I ran into the house and started yelling at the ball, you would think that I'm crazy, right? Okay, the ball broke the window. And the proof that it has being, the proof that it exists is that it broke the window. But if I ran in there and got mad at the ball, my brothers would have thought that I'm either an idiot or that I'm crazy. Why? Because though the ball has being, it does not have personhood. It is not personal. It's an inanimate object. And so hopefully that helps you to understand the difference between being in person, at least in a sense, right? My, and the, the ball also didn't get in trouble. We did, right? So did you get that's right. That's right. So we get, 
Do what? Did you get stoned? Oh, no, we didn't get stoned. I thought you said that's what you get for throwing it. <laughs> but no, we didn't get stoned, thankfully. Um, so it's hard for us to understand when we talk about these things. Uh, and I think that's because that we are finite. Right? We are finite, and so therefore, when we think about the word being, when we think about the word person, my being is limited to one person. Okay? I can't be here and in Oklahoma at the same time. Right? But I'm finite. God is not finite. He's infinite. And He's also omnipresent. And so He's able to be here and in heaven. He's able to be here and in Oklahoma or at the beach or wherever you know, God may be residing. But um, why is that? Because He's omnipresent and He's infinite. And so because of these truths, He's able to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but yet still be one God. Okay? Uh, another thing to point out, that might be hard for us to understand, and that's okay. There's lots of things in the Scriptures that are hard for us to understand. That does not mean that they're not true. The Bible teaches these truths, and therefore we should grab a hold of them and believe they're true. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with with Jeff Durbin, but I remember listening to him um, doing some apologetics on the street, and and he made the uh, statement one time that there's lots of things in the Bible that we as humans maybe can't comprehend, but we can apprehend them. We can grab a hold of them and believe that they're true. Right? And this is one of those things. Uh, Now, hopefully, you have a better grasp on what it is that we're saying here when we talk about the Trinity. And so I want to show you these truths from Scripture. And I want to do so with three foundations. Two of these I'll give you this week. The next I will give you next week. The first one is monotheism. The Bible teaches there is only one God. We have to understand this. We are not polytheists. We are not tritheists. We are not saying when we say Trinity that we believe in three gods. Every single anti-Trinitarian you talk to will just about tell you that we are tritheists. We are not tritheists. We are monotheists. Anyone who says we're not monotheists does not understand the Trinity. The second foundation is that there are three distinct persons. Okay? Notice the diagram here. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Father. However, they are all three God. Okay? That's an important thing to notice is that they are distinct <clears throat> there are three persons within the Godhead who are distinct from one another. And then our third foundation that we'll look at next week will be the divinity of the persons, that uh, all three of these persons are God. So let's look at our first foundation, monotheism. The Bible teaches that there is one God. I'd like to start by looking at the Shema. Turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4, or it should be on your handout. <clears throat> um, I think I've got every verse we're going to look at on that handout. I think the only one I really need you to turn with me to is John 14, but if you'd like to go there anyway, you can. You can. So Deuteronomy 6.4 it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Now, if you're not familiar with this text, this is a very commonly known text, and that is because this is the Shema. And if you're not familiar with what the Shema is, the Shema is a, uh, a piece of text that the Jews have traditionally prayed Uh, every morning, some of them every morning and evening, some of them multiple times throughout the day. And it is called the Shema because that the first word there, which means to hear, is the word Shema. Okay, So that's where it gets its name. But the central idea I want us to grasp here is that the text clearly says, the Lord is our God, the Lord, that's the word Yahweh or Jehovah, is one. Okay, So this teaches monotheism. This teaches there is only one God. So hero Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. Now what's interesting is that this text is often used by Jews to say that the Trinity can't be true because the text clearly says God is one and so therefore the Trinity can't be true because if Jesus is God, then that's two gods and so that's that's anti-monotheist. That's not true. They are confusing categories here. Monotheism, we need to get this, monotheism speaks to the being of God while Trinitarianism speaks to the persons of God. Okay, Now remember, we're not saying God is three gods. We're saying He's one God, three persons. But the irony about this text is that it actually supports the Trinity. The word one here in our English is the word ekai. My handwriting is horrible because I'm left-handed. My wife did this. I did not. But bear with me. The word one there... I know it looks like a four-year-old wrote it, but we're going to... That's terrible. Isn't it? That's worse than Zach's. Hopefully you can read it. So that's the word echad, okay? And this word echad 
is often used as what we would call a complex unity. I see you, Daniel, laughing at me. I'll, do, I'll try better on the next word. So this word echad is often used as what we would call a complex unity, which is a unity of more than one persons. Now let me show you what I mean. The first time it is used is in the very first chapter of our Bibles. Look there at Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. It says, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, you've got it in your hand out there, but what do you think that word first is? It's the word echad, okay, which is the same word in the Shema translated as one. And so the text says, it could also be translated and is in many translations, the NASB translates it this way, there was evening and there was morning, yom echad, day one or one day, okay? So let's, let's do this. I'm gonna, Trisha, I'm going to erase your beautiful thing here since we've used it. And let's do this. Father, I'm just going to do an F, Son, and then we'll do... Holy Spirit, okay? And these three are God. One, my handwriting is awful, y'all. Echad. I need to have Trisha up here for the illustrations. <coughs> One Echad. Okay? And then we have morning, evening, Echad, okay? Now my illustrations aren't as good as Zach's, but you get the point. You have multiple things that exist as one. So you have a plurality among a unity. Now look at another. Look at uh, Genesis 2.24 there. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they, the two, shall become one. Echad, okay? Now I'm not going to write that down because of how awful that is, but... Hopefully you get the illustration. You have man, one. Wife, one. Now you have two. They are one. Echad. Okay? So you have another plurality among a unity or a complex unity. Uh, now time will not allow me to show you all of the different ways that this is used. Um, but the other main two I'd point you to is one in Exodus 36, 13, where you have multiple pieces of the uh, tabernacle coming together to make one tabernacle. And then also Ezra 3.1 says that the people, plural, gathered together as one singular man. Okay? So the fact that the Shema says the Lord is one is not a problem for us as Trinitarians because this one can be used and is used often in the Old Testament as a complex unity. We believe in one God, but our God is complex in his unity. Another Old Testament text that does not use the word echad but clearly demonstrates the Trinity in a similar fashion is Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So you have let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image, singular. Notice image is, is singular. It is not images. Okay? There's a plurality of persons present. However, we still have the truth of monotheism present as well that there's only one being. Also note that, where is this? This is Genesis chapter 1. What's Genesis chapter 1? It's creation. Whatever form of creation you may take that to be, it is creation, right? <clears throat> and you have the Trinity present here for and involved in the creation process, which we also see laid out in other places as well as uh, in even more detail. Uh, no one really disputes that the Father is involved in creation, but in case someone did, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, For we know that there is only one God, the Father, who created everything. Okay, what about the Son? John 1, Colossians 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Apart from Him, nothing was made that has been made. Colossians 1, by Him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. Okay, so the Father's involved in creation. The Son's involved in creation. What about the Holy Spirit? If you were to look at Job 33, 4, Job says that he was made by the Holy Spirit. You also see in Genesis chapter 1, in the second verse of our Bible, that during creation, the Spirit is hovering over the waters. Okay? If he's hovering over the waters in Genesis 1, 2, before anything has been created, then that necessitates that he's not part of creation. Therefore, he is creator. Okay? 
So you have all three persons uh, involved in creation. I want to give you some more texts that teach monotheism. Isaiah 43.10, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. This is an important text to know for both our Mormon friends as well as our Jehovah's Witness friends. Uh, why for Mormons? Because that, what do Mormons believe? Mormons believe that there's literally billions and billions of gods. They believe that the God of this very planet was once a man like me and you who did enough good works that he went through something that's called exaltation and became a god of his own planet. They believe in mommy gods and daddy gods, and they believe that each one of us in this room, if we were to do enough good works and do what the, the Book of Mormon and, the, and what they think the Bible says tells us to do, that we also would become a god of our own planet. So you take the fact that there's all these people in the world that are Mormons who all think they're going to become a god, that's a lot of gods, isn't it? Okay, So they are very much so probably the most pagan religion you could think of, very much so polytheist. So this is a good text for them because it clearly says, uh, before me no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. Okay, well, what about Jehovah's Witnesses? Okay, why is this important for Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses reject the deity of Christ. They believe that God the Father is the Almighty God, and they believe that Jesus is a God but lesser than the Father. Okay, so they would be a form of henotheists. Um, and so they reject the deity of Christ. Now, what's interesting is this is actually the text where they get their name, and it teaches the deity of Christ. Notice there it says, You are my witnesses, declares Jehovah. The all caps Lord there is the word Jehovah. So this is where they get their name, and yet this text teaches the deity of Christ. Now, I don't have time to show you all of this right now. You can look it up yourself. But if you were to look at the Greek Septuagint, the Greek Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew. Anytime you look in the New Testament and the New Testament authors are quoting from the Old Testament, they're quoting from the Greek Septuagint. And if you were to look at the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, and compare it with the Greek that John utilized in John chapter 13, verse 19, you would see that Jesus uses these exact words of himself, identifying himself as Jehovah. So he quotes Isaiah 43.10 about himself. But even in the English, you can still see this, and I, I uh, highlighted that there in red. Okay, you can, it, what I have highlighted there in red, you can see that Jesus is clearly quoting this text in Isaiah about himself. Isaiah 43.10, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. And then John 13, 19, I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it takes place, you may believe that I am he. So you see the quotation there from Jesus, that he is the I am, that he is God. Isaiah 44, 6, I am the first, I am the last, besides me there is no God. Isaiah 44, 8, is there a God besides me? There is no other rock, I know not one. I mean, God could not have been more clear through the scriptures that he is God and God alone. And also note that Jesus quotes that text there in Revelation 22 and says the same about himself in verses 12 and 13. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So you see the deity of Christ there as well. Okay, what about the New Testament? Ephesians 4, 6. We have one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. 1 Timothy 2, 5. There is one God and one medi mediator who also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. What time have we got to be out of here, Zach? 10.40. 10.40? All right, I've got to keep moving. Um, <clears throat> just to point out here, this is an important text to note. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 there. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, a lot of your anti-Trinitarians love to bring this text up because they say, well, clearly he, Paul identifies the one God as the Father, therefore Jesus can't be God. That does not work. What is Paul doing here when he says one God, the Father? Okay, well, he is recognizing that there is a difference in role between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Okay, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are equal, but they also have differences in roles. My wife submits to me as her husband. Does that mean that she's less than I am? No, it does not. We are equal, but we have a difference in role. And Paul understood this as well as the rest of the New Testament writers. 
Also notice that he says one Lord, Jesus Christ. Is the Father Lord? Does the Old Testament not identify the Father as Lord over and over again? Okay, so if we're going to say that one God the Father means that Jesus can't be, or, or one God the Father means that Jesus can't be God, well then when he says one Lord, Jesus Christ, if we're going to use that same logic, then the Father can't be Lord. You tracking with me? Does that make sense? Okay. So Paul recognizes the difference of roles there, and that's not at all what he's saying. The point here, though, that I'm making is monotheism, one God. Now let's look quickly at our second foundation. The three divine persons of the Trinity are distinct from one another. The Bible clearly and consistently differentiates between the person of the Father, the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit. The Bible never identifies the Father as the Son, the Son as the Spirit, or the Spirit as the Father. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. They are three distinct persons. Their unity is in their being. Okay? Now let's start by looking at the baptism of Jesus in Mark 1, 9 through 11. It says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now, this text is important because we have all three persons of the Trinity present here, and yet they are all three clearly distinguished from one another. Jesus, the Son, is baptized. The Spirit descends on him like a dove, and the Father speaks from heaven to the Son, saying, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So there are three distinct persons. Now let's look at another text. Uh, turn to John 14. <clears throat> In John 14, you have the scene where Jesus is telling his disciples that he will soon be leaving them. Right? They are getting nearer and nearer to his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension where he will go to the Father. And so he is encouraging them through this text. But as Jesus is the greatest rabbi to ever live, he's also teaching them. And there is a lot of doctrine to be gained here. Um, and so uh, I want to look at this chapter and I want to notice a few things. The first thing I want to point out is we again have all of these texts here that show the unity between Jesus and the Father. Look with me at the unity we see. Verse 1, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Okay, so believe in God. Believe also in me. We know that there's texts all over the Bible where Jesus clearly says that if you do not have the Son, you also don't have the Father. Okay, Verse 7, if you had known me, you'd know the Father. Verse 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. In other words, if you're not going to believe me by what I've said, look at the works that I've done, look at the miracles I've done, look at the things that only God could clearly do that vindicate that I'm He, right? And so you look at these statements. I mean, can you imagine this coming from anyone who's not God? Would it not be complete? I mean, the Jews would have been completely vindicated in their, in their accusing him of blasphemy if Jesus is not God, right? These are clearly statements that could only be made by God himself. And then look at 13 and 14 there. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What does Jesus mean? Remember, he's telling them that he's doing what? He's going to be leaving, meaning he's not going to be on earth anymore. He's not going to be with them physically in person. How are they supposed to ask Jesus anything in their name? They're, he's referring to prayer. Well, who do you pray to? You pray to God. Prayer is a recognition that I'm man and he's God. And Jesus here is expecting his believers and his followers to pray in his name. Why? Because he's God. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now again here, notice you have all three members of the Trinity, starting in verse 16. And I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Spirit. So Jesus asks the Father, he prays to the Father, the Father sends the Spirit, distinct persons. Another thing to note here is that we also see that the Spirit is absolutely a person. The Spirit is not an it. Okay, notice how Jesus refers to the Spirit. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, the Spirit of truth whom? 
the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be with you. And you see the same down at verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. So the point to make here is that the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal it. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we need to identify him as a he because he is a person. Uh, I would not... Why does that matter? Uh, Well, because if we're going to talk about God, we need to talk about him in truth. And we don't need to talk about him as an impersonal it. If the Holy Spirit is impersonal, then he can't save you. The Holy Spirit is a person. I would not call this podium or that chair a he. Why? Because it's an inanimate object. right? I refer to the Spirit as a he because he is a person. Uh, The last point I want to make here in John 14, and then we'll move to our last text with three minutes on the board. Uh, Look with me there at verse 26. It says that he, the Spirit, will teach you all things. So Jesus tells his disciples that the Holy Spirit will teach them all things. How is the Holy Spirit going to teach them all things? He'd have to know all things. I thought only God knew all things. Is omniscience something that we all have or that other people have? Or only God has omniscience, right? Okay, well, the Holy Spirit's going to teach them all things. That means he has to know all things. He does know all things because he's God. So, uh, one more text that shows the distinction of the persons. Turn to John 17, and we will close with this text, and then next week we'll look at the deity of Christ as well as the deity of the Spirit. And a lot of these things are interchangeable. I know we've looked at a lot of the deity of Christ and the Spirit already, but that's because that all these scriptures pretty much teach both of, both of these truths. <clears throat> so John 17, look with me at uh, 1 through 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So take note of the personal pronouns that we see in verse 5 here. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So this is clearly... In any normal language, this is the way that one person speaks to another person. Okay, so we have the distinction of the persons here, but also notice where this distinction lies. With the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus had a glory with the Father before the world existed? How is that? Because he was there prior to creation. He is God. So not only do you see the distinction of the persons, but you also see what he's talking about there, which is he is clearly teaching and presenting his own pre-existence with the Father. He's looking back at the time that he had before the foundation of the world, uh, before the incarnation, uh, to the glory that he had eternally shared with the Father as God. So that's our two foundations. uh, And with me being out of time, let me remind you of the three. Uh, Monotheism. The Bible teaches that there is only one God. The second one is the distinction of the persons. Though the Bible teaches there's only one God, He also exists as three distinct persons. And then the third that we're going to look at next week is the divinity of the persons, that these three distinct persons are all identified as God. So I know that was really quick. I know uh, you all probably feel like you just got hit with a uh, fire hydrant or a hose off of a fire truck. Yeah, that works. (laughs) But hopefully it wasn't too fast for you to understand what we're talking about here. Okay, so I hope that that helps some. Next week we'll look at the deity of the Son as well as the deity of the Spirit. So let's pray.